I'll just jump in. I, you know, I, I've seen your statement explaining your decision, which sounds like, you know, it wasn't an easy one, but the right one for you and your family. Talk me through, um, you know, the decision and uh, especially since you've never regretted or anything, uh, your decision to vote to impeach the former president. Yeah. So, you know, first thing I would say is it, it has been and continues to be uh, the honor of a lifetime to have the opportunity to represent Northeast Ohio. Uh, it's, it's something that the, the constituents of the 16th district have gifted me and my family. We take it seriously. We love doing it. Um, and it is very bittersweet to, to not run for reelection. But the truth is when we think about what kind of life we want for our two kids, uh, for our marriage, what kind of dad do I want to be? What kind of husband do I want to be? And, and how that looks for us, um, that the honest truth is, you know, we have to do this. Uh, it's, it's the right thing for us. Um, it's sad to, to, to go, certainly, but, but ultimately, um, you know, if, if I'm not willing to put my family first, then, then what good am I? Uh, and so that's the decision. Um, and, and again, I know it's, it's disappointing for a lot of people. It's, it, it's the same for me, but, um, but we got to do what, what's right for us. Uh, talk a little bit about your statement. You had, you know, feared that, that the, you know, the atmosphere or the, the culture has gotten very toxic. Um, you know, and how does that play into that decision to put family first? Yeah, you know, um, admittedly, you know, the reasons one, two, three, four, and five, why we're doing this are, are to take care of the family and to live the, the family life that Elizabeth and I have always dreamed of. But the truth is the environment is very toxic. And um, especially, you know, the dynamics inside our own party, um, which have sort of stopped making sense to me in a lot of ways. Um, and so, you know, if, if you find yourself in a position where you're in a job that definitely doesn't work well for your, for your wife and kids and, and for, for your family as, as a whole, um, and then, you know, you're, you're fighting battles in an environment um, where we just seem to have lost the ability to, to dialogue and to reason uh, and to do it in a way that's respectful and thoughtful um, inside of politics. Uh, in, in normal society, you know, we, we still do the same things that we've always done. And, and people are incredibly kind and gracious across Northeast Ohio and the country. Um, but our politics has gotten so polluted um, that, you know, that, that environment uh, for me personally, is just not one that, that uh, I, I'm willing to be a part of uh, going forward after, you know, serving out my term. Yeah, and, and you're not the first. We've seen some of this in, in previous uh, election cycles, uh, people in have made that decision, but is there room for your brand of policy and ideology in the Republican party right now? Because you seem to have been a very serious congressman. You've, you know, we've talked on policy issues before, uh, just recently on Afghanistan. Is there room for you or people like you with ideology and policy in the party? I think there is. Um, now, you know, the thing I always say is voters ultimately decide the direction of the party. Uh, one thing I'll say, you know, if you, if you sort of look at the typical primary electorate in the congressional district, um, you're looking at roughly 10 percent. You know, as to, you know, how do we how do we change the dynamics where more people are voting in primaries, which is for congressional seats? That's where the decision is made. It's you know, these seats are all pretty heavily gerrymandered. And. You know, whoever wins that primary, whether on the Republican or Democrat side, depending on the district, that's going to be the member of Congress. But turnout is really low. Um, and so, you know, I know just from from being in the district and talking to folks and just getting a, a feel for what's happening on the ground, as well as looking at polling, that there's absolutely a room for uh, there is this room for someone like myself. I, I, I do believe I would have won had I, had I run. But, um, you know, the reality is you need more people to participate in the democratic process. Um, when I talk to people, the vast majority, majority are actually disgusted with both parties um, and, and they want to see something that they can latch on to. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of folks, my candidacy represented that. And, um, and that's disappointing for them and it's disappointing for me. But, but the truth is um, there is a way to, to sort of bring us back from the brink and it's, it's to get people participating in these primaries. Uh, Max Miller said, um, 
in one of his many statements uh, about you, but most recently that you've betrayed constituents. And so on that point of your district, when I look at it in the numbers from 2016, Rocky River, Westlake Bay Village, narrowly, but did vote for President Biden. Um, parts of Summit County did. Obviously, as we move into certain rural areas, they were, were more for Trump. But doesn't that suggest that our constituents aren't all necessarily betrayed or that there is room? Uh, how do you view that in that in, in light of his statement that this is only a, a one ideological party? Yeah, I, I don't really put any confidence in anything that he says, to be perfectly honest. He hasn't lived in the district long enough to understand it very well. But um, that, that being said, uh, look, I, I know from polling, but I also know just from, from being around and, and talking to folks on the ground um, that you know, it was a very difficult vote for sure. But one that I believe was the right thing for the country, uh, I believe the majority of constituents actually believe that. Um, but, but more to the point, in, in this job, you have to be willing to take tough votes that might ultimately end up with some challenges. I mean, that's otherwise, why do the job? The job's hard. Um, it's hard on families. It's, it's hard personally. Uh, I've always believed to do this job well, you have to be willing to lose it. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't put your own incumbency ahead of what's right for the country or, uh, or your constituents. And, and I've always tried to live that way. Um, I've always tried to, to govern that way. And I'm, I'm proud of the service. I'm proud of the decisions we've made. I uh, haven't gotten everything perfect. Nobody does. But, uh, but ultimately, um, I'm very happy with, with the amount of time that we've spent and, and the service we've provided. I'm going to ask you in a moment about some of the policies that you hope people will carry on that you started or some of the, the, the agenda items. But just on that uh, last point um, on, on the vote to impeach the president, had you not made that vote, given that you've already voted almost 90 percent of the time within the Republican ideological structure, do you think you would have faced this pushback if it came down to just that vote or if it wasn't there? Do you think you'd have a challenger in the primary? Hard to say. I mean, look, it's it's a free country. Anybody can can primary or run against you for any reason. That's one of the reasons why I've never really thought that way when it comes to how I vote. Um, you know, any vote you take, it, there's going to be passionate people on both sides of it. Um, so that's never been a consideration of mine. Um, but again, the, the truth is, whether I had taken this vote or not, um, this increasingly had become a, a life that just wasn't working for us as a family. And um, you know, it really started to crystallize as COVID started. And, you know, I went from being on the road, you know, 100 to 150 days a year to, to not being on the road much at all and, and being a, a more present dad and, and husband. Um, and then, you know, once vaccines and travel picked back up again, uh, it, it increasingly got to a point where we just kept saying, you know, I kind of like being home. <laughs> I like seeing my kids every day. I, I like being with my wife every day. Um, and, and being a more present dad and, and husband. And, and so, um, you know, compounding with the, the political environment is, is this reality and, and realization um, that, you know, if we're going to have the family life that we've always dreamed of, which has always been our, our top priority, um, then we need to make changes. And so that's, that's what we've decided to do. And um, I know it's tough and it's tough on me and, and tough on a lot of folks who are excited about what the work we're doing. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm no member of Congress at all if, if I can't put my family first. Uh, I, I think a lot of people will understand and respect that. That final question I'll come back to is uh, some of the agenda items, the policies that you were working within your caucus, what would you like to see them continue to do? What would you like to see them avoid on a, on a pure policy agenda? So whoever carries forward has to really be beyond just that 10% you talked about. Uh, what, what, what are those issues out there that you are leaving undone or uh, not yet complete? Well, you know, in our country, no issue is ever complete, right? Um, we're always evolving and, and we're always pushing, pushing new policies. I'll tell you, our focus as an office has always been to put our constituents first uh, and to serve our veterans. Our veterans have been willing to, or in some instances, paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our country. And, and so we believe we have an obligation to serve them. Uh, and so we're, we're working on some veteran homelessness and, and mental health uh, initiatives right now. And I hope to finish those off before we, we exit. But um, if we aren't able to get those done, you know, by next year, then, then hopefully whoever takes a seat will pick them up. 
uh, because there's universal agreement across the 16th district uh, that we have to do right by our veterans. Uh, additionally, we've been working on some good workforce training pieces of legislation uh, with Senator Portman for, for quite a while. Um, hope to get those done as well, but, but again, you, you can't always control everything in Congress. Um, and, uh, and then the final point, since I got here, and this is pre-COVID, uh, I've always believed the U.S. is in an ideological and existential battle with China. Uh, they are the great power competitor of our time, uh, and we have to do everything we can to make sure that U.S. values and U.S. leadership proliferate around the world as opposed to Chinese Communist Party values. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's also pretty universal across the district. Um, and so I, you know, we'll, we'll keep pounding on that, uh, and, and that work never ends. All right. Well, I'll leave you with this, and I'm sure everybody's going to ask what what's next. Will you keep a, a voice in in local politics? Will you uh, step a, step away? Uh, and um, obviously, being with the family is the priority. But uh, it will be hard to take the congressman out of the congressman here. Yeah, you know, once you you have the opportunity and the privilege to serve, I, I think it never the bug never quite leaves you. Um, and so, while I, I don't see myself pursuing elected office you know, anytime soon, you know, maybe when the kids are, are grown and out of the house, but, um, but I'll always stay engaged and involved and, you know, Northeast Ohio is always home. No, that'll never change. Uh, and so I, I hope to continue to have a voice, but really, you know, before getting into Congress, I was in business and, and I, I plan to go back into that uh, and, and make an impact there and, and hopefully be able to contribute to society um, in that way uh, because it's important as well. And, and I, I, uh, I look forward to that, uh, not before we finish off some work here, um, but, uh, but it's just been uh, such an honor and, and will continue to be so as, as long as I'm, I'm in the seat.